All right, guys, welcome back. We're going to be getting into chapter 22 today, um, looking at the time period after the Civil War known as Reconstruction. So in this video, we're basically going to be looking at six standards, 8.67, 8.68, 6.9, 70, 71, and 72. So just to go through those quick, 8.67, we're going to analyze the immediate political impact of the assassination of President Abraham Lincoln and Andrew Johnson's ascension to the presidency. 8.68, we're going to explain the significance of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the U.S. Constitution. 8.69, we're going to analyze President Abraham Lincoln's 10% plan. President Andrew Johnson's plan, and the Radical Republican plan for Reconstruction. 8.70, we are going to identify the significance of the Tennessee Constitution of 1870, including the right of all men to vote and the establishment of a poll tax. 8.71, we're going to analyze the conflict between President Andrew Johnson and the Radical Republicans including Johnson's veto of the Tenure of Office Act and his impeachment. Now we're going to look at a, only a little bit of 8.72. The other part of 8.72 we'll get into in Chapter 23. Um, 8.72, though, says explain the restrictions placed on the rights and opportunities of freedmen, including racial segregation, black codes, and the efforts of the Freedmen's Bureau to address the problems confronting newly freed slaves. So really we're going to be looking at that first part, the restrictions placed on the rights and opportunities of freedmen, um, and how that correlates with the black codes that states passed during Reconstruction. Next we're going to be looking at some of our objectives for today. Okay. So these are those I can statements uh, first, um, and these go again directly with the standard. So uh, at the end of this, hopefully you should be able to analyze the immediate political impact of the assassination of President Lincoln um, and Andrew Johnson's ascension to the presidency. You'll be able to explain the significance of the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments to the U.S. Constitution. Uh, you'll be able to analyze Lincoln's 10% plan, Johnson's plan, and the Radical Republicans' plan for Reconstruction. You'll be able to identify the significance of the Tennessee Constitution of 1870. You'll also be able to identify the right of all men to vote and the establishment of a poll tax as a significant part of the Tennessee Constitution of 1870. So basically how those two things are important. You'll also be able to analyze the conflict between President Johnson and the Radical Republicans and how that leads to President Johnson's veto of the Tenure of Office Act and Johnson's impeachment. Okay, Those are both parts of that conflict between Johnson and the Radical Republicans. And again, last, we will be able to explain how black codes were used to restrict the rights and opportunities of freedmen. All right, so this is chapter 22. Let's go ahead and get into it. All right, so after the war, of course, after the Civil War, uh, the U.S. had to find a way to bring the 11 southern states back into the Union. So the war is now over. We have to figure out a way to bring the 11 Confederate states back into the Union. Of course, everybody and their brother has a different opinion on how much the Southern states should be punished um, and what they should have to do to be able to come back into the Union. The United States also had to deal with the issues from 4 million emancipated slaves. Okay, so with the Emancipation Proclamation, and as we'll see here in a little bit, the 13th Amendment, we have all of these freed slaves um, that really don't know where to go. Okay, they've never had a job, uh, they've never had their own house, they've never been free. 
Okay, so they're kind of stuck in the middle. They don't know what to do. Um, so the United States has to figure out a way to help them. This time period, again, like we said before, becomes known as Reconstruction. Okay, and Reconstruction lasts from 1865 to 1877. So starting off, we're going to look at Lincoln's plan for Reconstruction. All right. So Lincoln wanted to be fair to the South and get them back into the Union as quickly as possible. All right. So with Lincoln's plan, there are three requirements for each state. First, 10% of the people who voted in the 1860 election in each state had to take an oath to obey the Constitution. Okay, so we're not talking about 10% of the whole state population. We're only talking about 10% of the people who voted in the 1860 election. Okay, so that number is going to be very, or not very, uh, but quite smaller than the state population. Okay, so only 10% of the people who voted in that 1860 election have to take an oath. Second part, each state had to set up a new government with a new state constitution. That's why we're going to be looking at the Tennessee Constitution of 1870. All right, so each state needs to come up with a new state constitution. And the third thing that each state needs um, in those new state constitutions, they had to abolish slavery. Okay, so that had to be one of the requirements of the new state constitution. Now, Lincoln's plan would also pardon all Confederates except for the highest officials and military leaders. So we're talking about people like Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee, some of those higher ups in the Confederate states not being pardoned. Most of your regular people who lived in that area or just regular soldiers um, for the Confederacy would be pardoned. Obviously, Lincoln's plan becomes known as the 10% plan um, because of the first requirement, um, only needing 10% of those people that voted in the 1860 election to take that new oath. Okay, so it becomes known as the 10% plan. Now, of course, we hit a speed bump um, with Lincoln's plan for Reconstruction, and that is his assassination. Okay, so on April 15th, 1865, Lincoln and his wife go to see a play at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. Uh, that play was Our American Cousin, um, and it was, of course, three days after uh, the South had surrendered to the Union at Appomattox Courthouse. So John Wilkes Booth, who was an actor, and Confederate sympathizer snuck into Lincoln's box and shot him. Uh, John Wilkes Booth is here on the very right of this picture, um, holding the pistol right behind Abraham Lincoln's head. Um, John Wilkes Booth was a very famous actor at this time. Um, he was very well known throughout Washington, D.C. in that area, um, so it was kind of a little surprising for him to assassinate the president. Um, after Lincoln was shot, he was still alive. Um, he would go on to die the next morning. So this, of course, has a ripple effect. Lincoln's assassination angers Northerners, and it opens the door for revenge on the South. Now, not a whole lot of revenge is taken on the South, uh, but a lot of Northerners are very angry because of Lincoln's assassination. Another group this affected were the African Americans. Um, they were promised or they were going to achieve a lot of gains uh, under Lincoln's Reconstruction Plan. Uh, but with his assassination and those plans being put on halt, um, they were not able to achieve what they had wished for. So Lincoln's Vice President Andrew Johnson, who is from Tennessee, now becomes president, all right? 
and Lincoln is the first U.S. president to be assassinated. So, speaking of Johnson, we're also going to look at his plan for Reconstruction. Uh, Johnson's plan was very, very, very similar to Lincoln's plan. Um, so he had a lot of the same ideas. Uh, Johnson pardoned most Southerners who would take an oath of allegiance. So as long as those Southerners or those Confederates would take that oath, uh, they would be pardoned and be welcomed back into the Union. Southern states had to create new governments and ratify the 13th Amendment, which would abolish slavery. That is the same for uh, Lincoln's plan as well. Um, but the one thing that does happen with Johnson being president um, is that southern states start passing harsh black codes. All right, so we'll talk about those here in a minute. But the southern states do start passing black codes. All right, so these black codes... Um, black codes were laws that only applied to African Americans that aimed to provide cheap labor and keep former slaves in a position close to slavery. Okay, so they were meant to take away the rights of African Americans in the South. Now, these codes did vary from state to state, but for the most part, um, they were pretty much the same thing. Um, so the wording might be a little different, but they were trying to restrict those same rights from state to state. All right, some of those being examples, um, they were prevented from gathering in public unless a white person was present. Another example is they were prevented from owning or carrying weapons. African Americans were also prevented from serving on a jury. Uh, they were prevented from voting. Um, one of the reasons, as you'll see uh, later on, is a poll tax. Um, the other will be uh, a literacy test, which we'll see later on as well. Um, and then even something called a grandfather clause, where uh, your grandfather actually had to vote um, in an election for you to be able to vote. And that's where we get the grandfather clause from. Another black code also uh, prevented African Americans from learning how to read, okay? Um, so a lot of former slaves were, of course, illiterate. They didn't receive an education, um, and those black codes tried to keep that that way by preventing African Americans from learning how to read. They were prevented from renting land um, as well. Um, so again, these black codes were trying to keep African Americans in a similar position that was close to slavery. Um, yes, now slavery is illegal, um, but, Africa, but uh, white Southerners wanted to basically keep African Americans in that same position um, economically and socially. All right, so the third plan that we're going to talk about for Reconstruction is Congress's plan. Okay. Um, we're going to see a group here known as the Radical Republicans. Okay, so this is the same Republican Party that we think of today, um, that we think of with Abraham Lincoln. So the Radical Republicans controlled Congress, um, and they wanted equal rights for freed slaves. Um, Johnson opposed this, okay? Um, so Johnson, who was a Southern Democrat... Uh, yes, was the vice president of a Republican president, Lincoln. Um, he, Johnson and the radical Republicans do not really see eye to eye on Reconstruction. Okay, so Johnson opposes Congress's plans, but they have the power um, to not really be affected by Johnson's opposition. So what Congress does is they pass a series of Reconstruction Acts, that place stricter penalties on all southern states except Tennessee. So Tennessee was the first state to rejoin the Union after the Civil War. Um, so they are able to uh, kind of escape these harsher penalties that are put on the other southern, the other southern states. So what Congress's plan looks like, okay? 
the first part, they are going to divide the South into five military districts under strict control. Okay. So those 10 Southern states, because remember Tennessee is already rejoined, are put into five military districts. Um, basically what that means is that the military becomes the police. Um, they are kind of in charge of what the people do. Um, they can tell what the people do when they kind of need to be where they need to be. Um, but the military has control of their own military district. The second part of the plan is that southern states had to draft new state constitutions. Again, very similar to Lincoln and Johnson's plans. Uh, the only difference is that in Congress's plans, those new state constitutions had to give the right to vote to all adult males. Another thing that's different is that Congress actually has to approve these new state constitutions. Okay, so the state has to approve them and then it has to be sent off to Washington, D.C. for Congress's approval. Another part of their plan is not only did the uh, states have to ratify the 13th Amendment, but they also have to ratify the 14th Amendment, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, um, and we'll kind of see what the 14th Amendment does for uh, the United States. But that was another uh, requirement of the Radical Republicans' plan. Now, Johnson, again, we see this conflict. Um, we talked about it earlier in the standards and the objectives. Uh, Johnson does not like the Radical Republicans' plan, so what he tries to do is he tries to uh, use his veto power as president uh, to veto these plans. Um, those, of course, get over, those vetoes are overridden by Congress, um, and these acts are put into place. So, another thing that goes with the conflict between Johnson and the Radical Republicans um, is Johnson's impeachment. Okay, so how that kind of goes, uh, Congress passed an act called the Tenure of Office Act. Uh, this limited the president's ability to remove government officers. So the president could not basically fire anyone without Congress's approval. Um, that's what the Tenure of Office Act does. So, of course, what does Johnson go and try to do? Uh, he tries to remove his Secretary of War, who doesn't like Johnson's Reconstruction policies. Well, because, because of course, Congress has passed this act, um, Johnson is now in trouble. So when he does this, the House of Representatives uh, decides to impeach Johnson. Now, this is just like President Trump's impeachment a couple months back. Um, the House of Representatives uh, voted to impeach Johnson. Um, once that happened, uh, his trial went to the Senate. Okay, and the Senate basically acts as the jury of any other court trial. Now, when Johnson's trial went to the Senate, he was acquitted by one vote. Okay, so he was found not guilty, that's what acquitted means, by one single vote. So he got to keep his job by one vote. Now, the three Reconstruction Amendments. Okay, when we talk about the three Reconstruction Amendments, we're talking about the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. The 13th Amendment. Okay, the 13th Amendment abolished slavery throughout the United States. Okay, so that's a very easy way to put it. Uh, the 13th Amendment says that slavery is no longer legal in the United States. The 14th Amendment, uh, the 14th Amendment grants citizenship to all persons born or naturalized in the United States and guarantees them equal protection under the law. Okay, so the 14th Amendment gives us all citizenship if we are born in the United States or are born in uh, 
an area that is owned by the United States. Uh, for example, there a person could be born on a military base in Europe that is owned by the United States. As long as it's owned by the United States, though, those people are still U.S. citizens. Okay. Also, you can be naturalized, um, which basically means that you have to live in the United States for a certain number of years. I believe it's either five or seven. Um, then you are able to take your citizenship test and become a U.S. citizen. Once you are a U.S. citizen, then, of course, you are given equal protection under the law. So we all have the same rights and the same protections as U.S. citizens. The 15th Amendment. The 15th Amendment has to deal with voting. Um, the 15th Amendment protects the right of all citizens to vote regardless of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. You will notice that one thing is left off of this. Uh, gender is left off of the 15th Amendment. So sorry, ladies, um, you will not be able to vote until the 19th Amendment is passed. Um, the 15th Amendment only protects voting rights uh, regardless of race or ethnicity, color, um, or if you were previously a slave or not. And those are the three Reconstruction Amendments. Again, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. So now looking a little closer to home, okay, we're going to look at Tennessee after the war. So the man pictured here uh, on the right side of the screen is William G. Brownlow. Um, he was named the governor of Tennessee in 1865 after uh, Andrew Johnson had left to become the vice president. Okay, um, So Brownlow will be the one to uh, take Tennessee through the first parts of Reconstruction. Okay, so Brownlow sided with the Radical Republicans and urged Tennessee to ratify the 14th Amendment. Again, uh, Tennessee ratifying the 14th Amendment will get us out of those stricter uh, parts of Reconstruction. Um, so on July 24th of 1866, uh, a little over a year after the Civil War has ended, Tennessee becomes the first Confederate state to rejoin the Union. Again, because Tennessee rejoined the Union very, very quickly, uh, we were saved from the harsher parts of Reconstruction, uh, like those military districts having Congress's approval to approve our state constitution and those things with the Radical Republicans plan. So Tennessee creates a new state constitution in 1870, uh, which said that slavery was abolished. Okay, so the 13th Amendment there. And it gave African-American men the right to vote, okay, which would also be the 15th Amendment. Okay, so we passed the 13th, ratified the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment here uh, by 1870 in Tennessee. Um, the one thing the Constitution did allow for, though, uh, was a poll tax. And this poll tax would be used to keep African Americans from voting. Okay, um, So it's pretty simple. You would have to pay a tax in order to vote. Okay, um, So with a lot of freed slaves and free African Americans not having a source of income, um, because remember, they don't own land. Um, they really haven't started businesses yet or anything like that. They do not have the money to pay the poll tax to vote. Okay, so this, was, this kept African Americans from voting um, in Tennessee. All right. Um, so that is chapter 22. Okay, looking at the first part of Reconstruction. Uh, with Lincoln, Johnson, and the Radical Republicans' plan for Reconstruction, Lincoln's assassination, Johnson's impeachment, uh, black codes, and then Tennessee after the war. Okay. In our next video, we will get into chapter 23, which of course is the last chapter in our textbook, um, and we will cover the last few parts of Reconstruction um, until it ends in 
1877. All right, so thank you for watching. Come back next time. We'll see you guys next time.